What did your family first move into Hackney? Um, when my parents were married in 1916, before that, my mother lived in Spitalfields and my father lived in Bethel Green. Um, he had a bad heart, he had a series of crashing heart attacks in 1923. Um, when they got married, they settled in one room in Abersham Road, that's just the Ridley Road. Um, of course, I don't think about that, but I was born somewhere around that. Um, so you were actually born 1916? No, I was born in December 1917. I'm not sure the days of their marriage, but it was probably the end of 1916, you see. Mm -hmm. um, and then the first thing I can remember is when we moved to Sandingham Road, where we had a bigger room on the top floor with a little scullery. Because it seemed enormous to me at that age, this room. Uh, the family was living in one room? Well, yes, there was uh, only me and my baby sister, the very baby, a tiny baby then, and my parents. And there would be one room for living in your sleeping room? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, see, you know, my mother was very clear in the house, but I would seem very luxurious to me, but uh, it's a normal room. Uh, uh, we ate in the scullery, uh, well, one in the kitchen, it was a little tiny scullery with, I think, but they, they all seemed to make a pumice were there or something, an old stone sink, you know, and uh, the old hip bath hanging up there, dad and hard work, hard fun, and that's work every week, boiling up the water, you know, but, uh, that's a story that you've heard many times before. Was there electricity in the house? No. Um, I can't remember when, yes I can, uh, but I was so familiar with gas mantles, uh, you know, that we must have had uh, gas there then. Um, but uh, when I was about five, my dad saved up enough, had saved up enough uh, to um, uh, to deposit down on a house in Fulham Road, which is in the borough of Hackney, but is perfectly state owned to me then. And uh, of course, in those days, uh, everybody left it because you really you couldn't afford to pay off for the house unless you had a tenant. So he let me upstairs, and I think at one time he and the pal uh, was a great handyman, a fellow hero of mine, because he'd been a, a fitter in the RFC during the war. Uh, um, Tied up uh, the basement room, you know, which. Uh, and made it quite happy to all right, and they looked at two anyway. Um, I lived the rest of my life up to the beginning of the war in Fulham Road. When was the move to Fulham Road? When I was five, um, and then about, I think it was about 1923. Do you know what the, house, the houses cost then? Mm -hmm. And the rents that you can show that you were to? I wouldn't have no idea of the rents. Um, I mean, they'd be silly by our present standards, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I mean, wages were so low, but um, uh, I think the house cost about 400 pounds. That would be the 20 year mortgage, you know. Mm -hmm. What was your father's work? He was a fur cutter. He worked in the factory in the city. Your mother worked at all? Yes, before the war. Uh, well, no, 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 I'm sorry, not after she was married. Uh, before I married, she worked in, it must have been somewhere near the docks in a canvas and cordage factory of works, but no what. Uh, uh, something maritime, you know. Can you, would, would you have said that Sandringham Road? And Fulham Road were specifically Jewish areas, but well, Fulham Road wasn't. Uh, I can't. There must have been more Jews living in Sandringham Road, but it wasn't uh, a Jewish area because all I can remember, again, uh, you know, I was only about three years old. It must be my earliest memories. Is the little gang of boys I played with in the street. I know that they weren't Jewish. Then may have, the, the wrong, obviously, you know, uh, that's the only thing I've got to go by. And the nearest school, um, 
Have you listened to my dad? He was very prim and correct sort of chap. Uh, but uh, there were two schools nearby, and one was Sigmund Road, where I think a lot of the Jewish boys went because it was a bit sort of prissier. And the chapel was a rough school, the General, General Road, Road, Chapel Road. Lane. And my dad said, no, let him go to the Chapel Lane and rough it a bit, it doing good. And it was the happiest time of my life when I won the scholarship. I think I, I cried when I left there, you know, it was a wonderful school. And uh, these boys from Miller's Terrace, so Miller's Terrace still there, uh, Arcola Street, then no, no, it was um, yeah. and yeah. And there was these two courtyards, a tenements of it, with big uh, iron ornamental gates. And uh, a lot of the uh, boys there uh, and their dads went away for periods, you know, and, and all that kind of thing. But, uh, I, I, you know, I can remember them touching the best of Mate Simmer, I mean, mm. and um, it never happened when I went on to the Gross of Hackney Downs. But I made friends that I went home to, but uh, Shackle Ray and I, I went, you know, we lived in, I lived in the homes of my uh, school friends, and the teachers were splendid teachers. So they were all three with kind of elementary school children and so who mm. come up, you know. And they, except, you know, the, the one master was the, the school bully, you know, in the park, I mean, they all seem to have their own knacks of knowing how to interest these small boys from Miller's Terrace and so on, so that they were loyal to the school, you know, and not only on the football field, but over, over the downs and the centre pitch, but uh, in school too. It was, I think it was a wonderful school. What age did you go to? Uh, well, I went when I was five, and, uh, I think that's what was then called the Junior County Scholarship. Uh, and I must have been 11 when I went on the Hackney Downs. Did many others go on to Chapel Lane? Were you one of the exceptions? Not in my year. Um, I don't know how many other on the scholarship. You see, in those days, um, my father had fairly steady work, except during the slump, uh, you know, around about 1931. And um, I don't know how many other boys, because there are some other bright boys, but I may have been the only one whose parents let him go on. Um, in fact, the same thing happened when I was at Hackney Downs, when I, a few years later, when I'd um, taken what was then called a higher school and I got a place at college. And I felt so kind of inferior to the boys in my street who were another game all together that I played with, who were all going off to, been going off to until 14, that I, I didn't take it up, my I got done instead, you see. Um, it's kind of, the mores are different. Now it's, even in poor working class families, a boy or girl who wants to go into higher education goes. But in men, it, it was kind of, not only did the parents want the kids out very often, but the boy or girl wanted to be earning money at 14, especially the boy. He wanted to wear his long trousers and have his buy his wood vines, you know, and uh, and be a man. Um, so in my year, I think I was I, no, I was definitely the only one who went on to a secondary school. There may have been one or two who went up to central schools. You took took a bit about the uh, the kids in the street. Do you have um, do you have memories of um, the games and the games that will be played? Uh, very vividly, um, you see, uh, Alden there was a kind of step up the social scale. It was, it's quite Dickensian because uh, all the people who lived there seemed to be craftsmen and skilled workers. You know, Clerkenwell, not far away, traditionally a great centre for craft trades or sort of small scale engineering, watchmakers and die stampers and people like that. And nearly everybody in the street seemed to be very respectable working men. I mean, the, the, the doyen of the street, who lived a few doors away, was a messenger in a government ministry. And this really played even at the top of the social scale, you see. Um, and there was an old man, really out of Dickens, who was a, one of these old clerks who sat in a high stool in a basin somewhere. I could write the Lord's Prayer on the back of a sixpence, which he did for, you know, did for us. Um, and uh, there were lots of children. There was very little traffic in those days. Uh, the street looked nice because everybody kept their houses nice and clean. And you know the old business about the 
that on the doorsteps. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, were they mostly owner occupied or? Well, know? owner plus the owner's tenants. Right. Uh, you couldn't call it flats. No. Um, I mean, what you see, I remember that one essential thing was that uh, since the two or three families in the house, or it might be the two families and the uh, the young bachelor workman or the young lady workman who take in the odd room, uh, all had to share the same lavatory. Um, you, you looked out sharp for respectable people who, who would keep it nice and clean, you know, because... You know. <laughs> so uh, there we were, and every year they used to um, uh, come and uh, tar the street and lay it with yellow gravel. It was a great event in our lives. It was really a, sp a spring festival, and we would smell the tar, and the steam rollers came. And I can't remember the games. We, well, when we were small kids, I do remember the games we played. Was, first of all, there was a gigantic hopscotch, which there wasn't enough traffic to sort of rub out. Boys and girls played on. Uh, the girls tend to go off on their own and play indoors and uh, lead their own lives. Um, and then uh, the boys used to roam around. Uh, this is five upwards. Uh, there was a lot, still a lot of horse drawn traffic in the twenties, and a lot of horse troughs. And we either used to wait by a horse trough and get a lift uh, out to Epping Forest and catch tiddlers, um, or uh, we hang on behind, and then um, you got some little bugger in, on the pavement shelf and whipped behind you, Mister. Um, and if it was a cold, and it felt you were cold, as you say. Yes. Was that was the hanging around of the horse drop a kind of recognised form of hitchhiking? It was, and a lot of the particular chaps who were going out empty to pick up a load, they were very nice to the kids, and they say, uh, up on some, you know. And, um, I mean, in the 1920s, uh, London hadn't really taken off as far as growing was concerned. Uh, I remember that my father's brother bought a house in Tottenham, and it was just uh, three blocks back from the main road, and it had been all fields there. And you only had to go out to Edmonton or Enfield, and you were in the country. Uh, there were glass houses around the lane and so on, but still to us it was the country. And um, the buses and trams that ran past, the six and nine bus that ran past, uh, my dad was a great one for the open air or parks and so on, and he'd come down from work in the evening and say, well, I want a breath of fresh air, because his lungs would be full of fur, fur so, you know. And we get the 69 bus to Wormley. Um, it's like John Wilkins' ride. If you go out along the old road, um, you know, not Cambridge Road, but the old road north, uh, you can still see these old pubs, uh, lovely old pubs, set right back in the courtyard um, where the uh, horse brakes uh, and excursion brakes, you know, used to pull in where people would come out from the East End and dulce them. Uh, for a day at the weekend or for a drink in the evening. And we just used to go have a bus ride out to Wormley and a walk up in the side lanes and we really thought we were in the country and then come home at well, 10 o'clock, you know, if we're being really treated. Um, what I remember about um, later on in Folden Road, uh, and this is a great sort of mystery to me, was how it worked was the Street Football League. And I wonder if they still have them. Uh, in every street, the kids made up a football team. And I don't know who did the negotiating or what, but we had a, a match virtually every Sunday morning. And as cricket wasn't our game, I mean, I love cricket when I got to have me downs. Um, but um, it was football virtually all the year round. And there was always another street to play. Uh, we played home matches on have me downs. And we went as far afield as London Fields one way and Hackney Marshes the other. And there was somebody, <laughs> I don't know, uh, m m make fixing fixtures on street corners. I don't know how it happened, but we just knew we were going to uh, to, uh, to to play Santos of the Street. Can, those you, can you remember the streets you played? No, I can't at this stage. But they were all over the borough. That's the thing. It wasn't just Farley Road next door, or Amos Road, or uh, Gordon Road across in Stoke Newington. Um, you, I don't think we ever went as far as Victoria Park to play, but you, you've played streets that you've never heard of before from all over the borough. And Sonny Bates or Vic Howells or whoever it was that was running the team says, oh, well, I picked up this match, you see. 
Um, but the other ritual thing, uh, which was nothing like, um, it was not a, a terribly violent activity, but it was the street fight. Um, this was a kind of ritual. Um, somebody would come around and say, um, it was four weeks that beforehand. Uh, well, again, we're having a fight with Miller's Terrace on Saturday. And it was more show than blow, if you know what I mean. Uh, we'd all sally around on Saturdays. I was a wee little, you know, and my mum was always telling me to look after my glasses. So I would go in the rear and sort of make a lot of noise. But then you'd have one of these kind of ritual street fights where nobody got hurt very much, but a lot of fun was had. Um, it sounds like, it really sounds like medieval village football without the football. Um, so the, foot, the football team doubled up as, as the street gang. Uh, uh, well, it was all very elastic, you mm. know. Were people still making grottos? No. Some people I used to talk to was some time ago talked about making grottos out of bits of shell, horse shell arms. Well, where were these grottos? They would make them in the streets and they would stand by them. Oh no, no. Uh, I'm afraid the only um, with uh, you see um, the only activities of this sort we did were a uh, to go around collecting horse dung and selling it at the front doors at a penny a bucket um, because there's plenty of it and it's good for the garden. And the other thing, uh, so late confession, uh, was um, in the were Potter streets where we used to cut the flowers in the front gardens. Um, very neatly, and not, you know, the whole, you know, the moment of things with our front garden, we just take half a dozen tulips, I think, and then go around selling them at front doors. But apart from that, I can't, uh, no, um, uh, we never had anything as creative as making grottos. Um, where I did see something like a lovely grotto was in my grandfather's street in Bethnal Green, uh, Hare Street, which is one of the old Huguenot Weaver streets, and there was a courtyard there which Millicent Rose, the London historian, mm -hmm. which is a live photograph that had in her book in the East End of London. There was a little courtyard where the uh, market people used to keep their barrows, and um, they whitewashed this, they put a trellis up in it, they grew roses all over it, and I think there they had decorations with seashells and all sorts of things. And they really, to me, it was a, it was a, a magic cavern. Every time I walked past this alley, I, you know, to see my old granddad, I used to peer down uh, this, uh, into this courtyard. You, you mentioned um, selling horse manure and things. Was, did, did you ever get any um, part-time jobs while you were at school? Or school was... No. Um, I didn't, but a lot of the boys did newspaper rounds. Um, a lot of the boys may have had other part-time jobs that I didn't know about, but as even then, I don't, he's 13 now, but even then there, there was a minimum age for, um, you know, when schools were allowed to work and you had to attend school and there was very little truancy. Um, they may have kept quiet about it, I don't know. When you went to Hattie Downs, I mean, um, was that a fairly kind of kindly school because it was uh, a grammar school and it knew that it had been very selective, or was it run on fairly in the first year? Well, um, when did you teach at Hattie Downs, by the way? Much like 69 to 73. Yeah. So, uh, well, Hattie Downs was a good school when I was there, um, and, you know, I have plenty of reason to go to it. Uh, there was a good bunch of masters, uh, and um, I haven't got the fierce loyalty to it, mind you, that I had to tackle them. But uh, on the whole, I was sorry to leave and a bit afraid to go out into the big world. And uh, I reckon I got as the, all the East End grammar schools and secondary schools and those days used to give boys quite as good an education as they get to the public school, leaving out the Greek, you know what I mean. Mm. It was a conventional education of the old type. Oh, incidentally, Shackleville was, uh, when I was at Shackleville, it was surprisingly up to date. Uh, the teachers used to uh, teach in a, a very liberal manner. 
uh, they would take on, on, first of all, they would keep us up to date with all sorts of current events, you see, from the papers. And they would use these, some celebrities dash across the world to teach us geography. And I can't believe that children in modern schools, from what I've heard of kids who go to schools, you know, like around here, uh, went out as much as we did. Uh, not under the museums and the tower and all that, but uh, while I was at Shackleville Lane, we were taken to every factory you can possibly imagine. Um, we went once to the docks to see how the docks worked, once to go on board a big merchant ship to see how that worked, uh, once to a power station. Um, and um, the travel was free because the LCC owned the trams as well as the schools, you see. And I can remember bumping around all over London. Uh, it was wonderful. Just, I mean, we, it, they really taught us what about the. Well, within limits about the world we lived in. Um, grocers, uh, it's hard to answer your question about authoritarianism um, precisely. The fact is that it was a good school. Uh, it also had, uh, when I look back at it, its comic side. I once considered writing a novel about my school days just as a sort of you know, an e you know, not an easy, but a sort of lighter thing. Mm -hmm. And I realised that it, it would, in effect, be a comic novel. I, I'd be taking the wiki out of myself, of course, as well as the school. But uh, a couple of the, the, the masters were a couple of them were comic characters. And the headmaster, whom I, I, I admire very much, and uh, he knew all the boys, and he spotted quite early that I was on to English, and got, he had a study up in the tower. and. Uh, game with one of his books and that kind of thing, you know. But um, I always thought he imagined himself as the head of Grey Friars. Uh, uh, incidentally, no social history, I think, is complete unless you know how gripped so many working class children were then by the magnet. Uh, and how these public school boys were their heroes. I mean, when it was revived after the war, Billy Bunter was the central character, but then he was just on the, on the margin. It was the schools and gyms and Grey Friars and so on. So when I went to the grocers, as we still called it, and saw these masters with their gowns on, you see, um, don't suppose they wore gowns in the world. Oh, yes, um, yes, yes. And uh, yes. old Jenkin Thomas, the headmaster, who had flossy white hair and brilliant ginger eyebrows, so we all assumed his hair was dyed. Um, he used to also wear a mortarboard, uh, it sounds like uh, one of the even war schools, and walked about swishing his gown, you know. Um, and there were whackings, but they were very rare. And on the only occasion when I was uh, got whacked, I got four in a form whacking. Uh, uh, it was great fun. I really thought, oh, this is just like an magnet, you know. Um, there wasn't there, I mean, it was must have been unusual in that it was a grammar school, a very English kind of grammar school, yes. but whose population was mostly Jewish. Well, it wasn't when I went there. It was just changing. In fact, uh, it was until the year before I went there, uh, there was a very big uh, weeding out of applicants. And whether that was at all selected from the racial point of view, I don't know. But the borough changed very rapidly. See, I went there in 1929, and before then, uh, Clacton, which was its immediate catchment area, you see, and all those streets over like Benthill Road and that side, you know, the other side of the Downs, um, they were, they seemed to be the quarter of uh, well-to-do, old-fashioned hackney tradesmen, people who could afford to send their sons, because it was mainly a paying school then, and they just took a small quota of scholarship boys. Uh, in my year, 33 scholarship boys applied, and uh, my mum, I remember, took that with fear and trembling uh, for the interview. And I think it was the first year in which they took all the 33 applicants. And I think from more or less the time I went into it onwards, um, it sounded like I'm leading the tribes of Moses into the desert, you know, the Jewish, um, uh, the proportion of Jews in the school seemed to grow until it was very noticeable. But it was by no means predominant, I mean, when I left. And um, I can just remember all my heroes at the school, all the sixth form, those of them was the first 11 of the cricket and football and so on, and um, uh, there was just uh, the occasional Jewish boy here and there among them. But um, that, uh, when I say that doesn't go back very far, of course, I, um, uh, I'm now at an age where I don't realise that 1929 is um, 
as my son says, he says it, 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 it's like the old dad, but it, it's olden times to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, there has been so much change since. Yes, yes. Now the Jews have been succeeded by the new immigrants, you know, the um, patrons of the Hebrews. So English was straight away, I mean, a, a great interest of yours. Yes, oddly enough. Um, was that to do with inspired teaching or your own interest? Mm. Well, a mixture, uh, perhaps. Um, you know how Pinto went to Hackney mm. Downs ten years after me. I don't know if that was 19, 1945, that's it, before your time. Mm. Uh, and he had many times uh, recorded his debt to Harold Brierley, his English teacher. Um, it only came back to me in one of those warts of memory, which, you know, I, something I've completely forgotten, but um, in the street when I was a small kid, I um, used to tell stories to the kids. And this was really, as I wasn't very good in the pump shop and, uh, and uh, liked on the well, if I was worked into a book to look around somewhere where there wasn't much for me to do. Um, this gave me my status because um, when we weren't swapping comics or reading each other's wizards and so on, uh, I could sit down on the curb and the others all around me and tell them a story. So, you know, uh, there must be some people who have a kind of need to tell stories. Which, made up. Up, which I made up, yes. But I probably drew the material from them, for them from the masses of books that I uh, uh, read. You see, both my parents were exceptional in, in this, that um, uh, my father was, uh, when he came to England when he was 12, uh, he had, from my eyes, many perfect English that nobody could detect an accent. Um, and uh, he was in a, a kind of old-fashioned Victorian type self-improver. And his reading was mainly, uh, and a lot of these old sort of craftsmen in the street were the same, so that uh, those to come in and have arguments with them about free thought and things like that. Um, none of them were ever involved in party politics, although all were agreed, especially come election time, that working, you know, you've got to stick up to the working man. That was as far as they would go. Um, but, um, and then he would read books of popular science, like This Wonderful Universe by Sir James Jean and so on. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, uh, and it was completely, you know, unlike the other women, uh, loved reading. And uh, I remember, because it was the age of the open front door, when people walked in there each other's houses, and I remember my mother sitting reading Pride and Prejudice, which she discovered in those house public library, and she was loving it. And a couple of the neighbors coming in and sort of, you know, standing there, and good neighbors saying, oh, cool, look at her, a school teacher, you know. And she definitely passed this on to me. Um, I remember, um, I mean, when she let me loose in the children, she, there weren't so many branches of the public library, we, but we used to have this after school walk right across the North Ward Road, the Clapton End, to that branch. And uh, I'd come back from the children's library with a lot of books by Percy F. Westerman and Kenty and people like that, you know. Uh, and she'd get a couple of books from upstairs. Um, and then later on, uh, I mean, she had no guided taste in books, but uh, she would get the good companions. Uh, I remember, I think, I, I think she, she read aloud to us or passages from it. I know we all loved, the whole family loved it, you know. The priestly novel. The priestly novel, yes. Um, and I've still got a sentimental affection for old priestly because um, the first novel of his that I read on my own was Angel Payment, which was a much better novel. Mm. And, it, and I always have loved London and from childhood. I used to roam about. All kids had the freedom of the streets then, and my mother says that in 1908, she and her brothers and sisters and their friends used to walk all over London. Nobody was afraid of the traffic. And I, I used to imagine the past of London and what a bit about medieval London and so on. Um, I, I, I don't know if London, if, if London is still love London, or if, if there's, you know, I mean, a city should be accumulated memory. Um, uh, that uh, When enough it's been bombed and torn down, uh, you're really killing, I think, memories that people need. But I'm sure I've strayed off the question. Well, I was interested yeah. in what time to me you just said. Uh, oh, yes. I, I, I was going to say, I, I told, I, I, I remember, I, I remember this morning about telling the kids stories, but my imagination was fed by 
formed the boys' weeklies mm. uh, and uh, the adventure books that I'd read, and I'm sure I've, I've pitched all my ideas from them, but um, there you go, you see. But both at the chapel, um, uh, I, uh, you know, teachers used to pay attention to me because they liked my compositions, as we, you know, we used to call them. And um, I had no master like Briley at um, at uh, Hackney Downs, but uh, we had I had two very good teachers. One, uh, Dickie Richards. Do they still keep the original names of the houses there, or did they when you were there? No, they changed while I was there. Uh, I knew Joe. Well, I knew Briley quite. Well. Yes, but uh, Richards was one of the original teachers at the school. From you know, because there was a house named after him, Richards' house. And um, he used to mark my essays very well and very critically, and I learned from uh, the things that he knocked out, you know, and says, you know, we would say, no, you know, think for yourself, um, don't write down somebody else's phrases, you know. And then because there was. I would imagine, I mean, sorry, I was just yeah, right. but it, yeah. I mean, it, I'm, also, I'm very interested in the history of English teaching, and it yeah. does seem to me that still composition in the, you know, up until the Second World War yeah. meant more discursive kind of prose, you know, uh, why, when, you know, stamp collecting as a hobby. But there was not so much any emphasis on writing about one's own experience. No, I know. Um, I thought of that when I saw one splendid issue of the school magazine uh, produced, I don't know how many years ago, it was after the war, and it was, was it printed at the school? It was a big thing. And it had poems in it, it a lot of uh, sort of free expression, yeah. boys writing down these things. And there was one heartbreaking little story, um, which was obviously a boy being enabled to pour out his grief at last, which was the boy, a, a little boy who'd lost his mother. And he goes off for a long, long walk uh, along the banks of the Lea because I think he gets lost in the end and they send him home, you know. Mm. I don't know if you ever saw this, but it was. A such a touching story and, and I thought so valuable mm. on the part of some teacher to have yeah. elicited this from the boy and so good for the boy himself. No, um, it was still the age when they set subjects like my holiday. Mm. Um, very few people had holidays except the Country Holiday Fund, uh, which I still have a sentimental regard. Um, uh, but, uh, or uh, our visit to the tower or something like that, you see. But um, I know when I got the grocers, I used to disregard the rules. Uh, I'm not in the first year, but after that, uh, I would write a short story and give it in. And um, one of these good in, Dickie Richards, you see, was very tolerant. Instead of throwing it back at me, he would, he would say, keep me back after you hear it and just discuss it with me, what, what I'd written. And then we had another, an Irishman, who was a ferocious disciplinarian. Um, we, we had to spend the whole year reading and learning passages by heart from the essays of Addison. And he gave us a list of forbidden words and phrases, like very, and in my opinion. And it really, if you're going to write, it does you a lot of good to spend a whole year not using any of these words. But it may not fit in with your conception of English teaching, you see. Um, and then, as I say, there was the headmaster who, um, you know, he had 600 boys to remember. I was quite young when he, he must have had some things that I'd written shown to him and called up to his study and said, well, they're my books. And he said, you take one that takes your fancy now, he said. And then uh, the boy would queue up on the stairs at the head and see him about and said, well, you bring that back and take, take another. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and also, mainly English essays, but there was also kicking and things like that. And uh, uh, I, I, you know, um, I thought it was rather good that he paid that much attention. So when did you think of writing your first novel? Before? No, uh, I thought of writing my first novel in my daydreams uh, when I was quite a young boy, I, uh, whether I was 12 or 13, I don't remember, but I, you know, I, I even knew the title of it, so I would, have, I would never repeat it. And uh, I saw that it was a great success, you know, the writers of the 30s and uh, all that kind of thing. But I made no attempt uh, to write fiction, uh, except for a couple of poems in a school magazine. Well, they're not fiction, but no attempt to write anything of my own. Um, 
and said, I'll have that story. Uh, but that takes me over. Okay, I mean, yes. okay. Well, what happened was that um, uh, I let, uh, I had a place at King's College London. Uh, I wanted to be a historian, but uh, there was no, nobody ever told you at school. I, I, I never knew what, I mean, uh, I never knew how you became a historian or what historians did. I never knew, for instance, I didn't know how a university was organized. I didn't know about university teaching. I didn't know what kind of course. Uh, you see, the history master wanted me to take a history scholarship at Cambridge, you know, in, in the coming summer holidays and set my name up for it. And I really had this place, as I say, at King's. And uh, all I could think of was to become a school teacher, you see, and maybe teaching history. Um, and I, and the power of mine, suddenly sort of sickened of this and said, well, for God's sake, let's go out and get a job instead. We were uh, about 17 and a half, so the summer holidays, you know, uh, last year at school. And when it came to I hadn't got the courage to get a job in the factory because my father had worked in the factory all his life. His hands were all calloused, you know, from holding this particular knife that they use. And... Um, He'd been doing all this so that his son shouldn't have to work at the bench. So um, we both got jobs in the LCC. Uh, and then I joined the local Labour Party, but I soon became prominent in Labour politics. Um, it, I was in the Labour League of Youth, and the adjacent Labour League of Youth was, I was soon running it, and the adjacent one was run by Ted Willis. Uh, and we soon teamed up and got a kind of militant tendency, but with a small and a small T going in, you know, that part of North London. And uh, very soon we were running the uh, journal of the Labour League of Youth, whose uh, circulation we boosted from 2,000 to 30,000 with 50,000 in a good month. And we were writing most of it between us under different names. And we'd be putting all the local news. And that would be, you know. So this was London or national? National. Yeah. Uh, this would be sort of 14 pages. So we'd spend all night sitting up in a little office we'd hired, uh, writing articles, the most important one in our own names, and all the rest under different names which we made up. Um, and I had several years of this kind of uh, labor journalism. I don't know to this day whether journalism is corrupting if you want to be a writer, if you're going to be a writer, or if it does give you uh, a kind of fluency of thought and words. And um, uh, because we soon met Fleet Street journalists, uh, you know, we met this crowd of radicals on the Daily Mirror and were very proud of drinking with them in their pubs in, was it, Petal Lane, and, you know, and they were explaining to us how you load the whole story into the first paragraph and how you organise it, you've got to keep the reader's attention all the way through. And it may be that, um, I mean, the flair for technique in a writer may be in, in born a talent like my dad's flair for cutting furs, you know, or uh, my brother-in-law is a craftsman cabinet maker, you know, um, but um, it may be, perhaps it's also developed by journalism, I really don't know. Anyway, uh, I simply had no time to think of writing novels and then, and, 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 until July 1940 when I was called up, and then I was in the army until spring of 1946. And all the time there, I was seeking experience and knowing exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to write a novel about the war. Um, and. Um, when I came out, you we were interviewed by a committee who said, what do you want to do and can we help you? And I said, yes, I want a typewriter. And because of that, there was a, then a 12 months waiting list for it. And they got me a, a portable typewriter straight away and I just went home. Um, went home. Uh, yes, I, I, I was quite old for the first two years after the war. And um, I went back to live with my parents. Uh, and then as I got better, I began to sort of go off and stay more and more with, with with friends and rent rooms from them, and, uh, and then I fell in love with Paris when I got over there for the first time. Um, well, after first of all, the French flu, and began going to Paris for periods and living there. I wrote one book there. Um, but uh, yes, um, so was until two years after the war, I lived in Hackney from the city. From I got that the first novel. Yes, I got a job. Uh, um, I never got back in. I never got into real journalism. Uh, I was a member of the NUJ, but uh, I, I got a uh, film job, film journalism, actually, Ted Willis 
just as a man of many enterprises, started a theatre magazine, which was very successful in its time in the profession, you know. And um, he made me the editor, uh, and so that was my job. But I used to work at the office until at least half past eight at night, uh, and then go home and have supper, and I worked on the city from, from the dark nights. Um, and it was partly something I had to get off my chest. And partly, after the war, the first few novels to get published were all by officers. Uh, and um, some of them had a curate. Well, they were either by officers or by, um, you know, and also Penguin New Writing, which was a great influence at the time, um, had a, a lot of stories by um, the kind of intellectuals. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't, you know, the kind of uh, to whom the army was an agony, you see. And they wrote about it in this way, this awful experience you have to go through, sleeping in a, a hut with 35 ruffians, you know, that kind of thing. Or um, uh, uh, the officers didn't seem to have the Robert Graves touch, you know, or uh, when Graves and Sassoon, uh, they knew that the, the Tommies were the ones who were getting the rough end of the stick, you see. And the, well, I just read these books and I felt well, nobody's writing about um, the soldiers were the nation in arms. They were the, the whole people, or, you know, everyone who was fit to. Um, they were the young men of the nation, you know, and um, I, I had, it was, I mean, I was, obviously, I was on the left then. And I, I think it was partly the kind of, that much of a political intention that I set down, hammered out this book. But it was also, I think, therapeutic because, um, I, uh, I wasn't in the thick of the war all the time, but I was in some uh, fairly, you know, some big actions, like leaving troops on D-Day and all that. And towards the end of the war, I had two fairly hefty concussions, and uh, I, I think that's why I was pretty ill for the period after the war. And it may be that writing this novel really put me on my feet the same as I think this article by this boy who'd lost his mother. Yeah help him, you know. One thing, I looked, no, I looked at my watch because uh, uh, my wife, uh, she, she's, in case she goes out before we need, she left a tray of coffee and things in the room, but so somehow I'll go ahead and get it. Um, now because how I got in, but interested in novels was yes. I, um, I mean I, I read everything I can about the East End of London. Yes. And I suppose from about five, six years ago, I started going back to the British Museum and I looked out Simon Bloomfield's Jewish yeah. Boy and, yeah. and Willie Goldman's mm -hmm. East End My Cradle. And I wondered whether you, and you aren't writing is completely different. I mean, you obviously yeah. weren't going to write the Jewish novel were you, when you wrote your first novel, because it's completely, and it, were you aware that there was a kind of school of writing? Yes. Uh, in a way, I was a generation younger than them. I don't know how my age compares with, with, with theirs as a group. Um, uh, but uh, I was post-war. I mean, I never began to write for myself until uh, sometime, give it a few months after I was demobbed, say autumn, summer autumn 1946. And these were all writers of the 30s. Uh, and they were all discoveries of uh, John Lehman and his... Uh, his attempt to find a proletarian literature. Uh, I know it had its condescending side. Um, I was going to say before the Hackney Down School had a, a, a very strongly comic side too. I probably did say, well, you can say the same about the, the, the whole John Lehman thing, you know. Um, uh, sort of fell, in, fell in homosexual love with the working class, you know. But, um, it doesn't do the sneer at it because uh, it was a valuable enterprise in its time. And um, they gave these writers a chance to, exp to express themselves. Um, the only one I knew was Ashley Smith. Yeah. Uh, one of the others, oh, Roland Camberton, he died yes. quite young, didn't oh. he? Well, I met him once at a party. Oh, because he's not, I mean, he's the only person that's written more about that. Yes, he wrote specifically about Hackney, and I thought he went to Hackney Downs as well. I had an idea that he had a, a, a he wrote a book of short pieces. I thought one of them was about this comic opera cadet battalion that the school had, um, but I may be wrong. 
But I, I wonder I, what happened to it. Would you say you probably got Well, I, I don't know. I, d um, I don't even remember when I met him. It, it must have been fairly early on in my my own career, and I can't even remember what what party he was, except it was somewhere in Donswood. Uh, I was just beginning to venture into these uh, exotic territories, you know. Um, and uh, we just had a little uneasy talk. But what happened with Ashley Smith was that um, he got in touch with me and many, many years after the war. And uh, partly because he liked my books and partly because he was very lonely, had lost touch with the world of eyes. And I don't know what had, something had moved him to send me a letter. It may have been that he'd read a particular book that had just come out. And I lived on my own then in Maryland and uh, asked him to come up you know, and have a drink or some tea. And uh, we became quite friendly uh, in a very occasional way. You know, I said, well, when you this one, come up, have a cup of tea and talk, you know, because he obviously wanted to pour his heart out. And he was saying if only he could write again. And just at that time, uh, Fred Warburg, Sepham Warburg, uh, launched a series of books in which um, he sent writers either back to the original environment mm -hmm. or uh, Mervyn Jones, a friend of mine, went to the potteries and worked for a while at Spode mm -hmm. uh, Pottery and wrote a book about it. Um, and in fact, when my wife and I got married, he came back and gave us a Spode jug, you see, as our wedding present. Um, and they asked me if I'd like to write a book about Hackney or the East End. And I said, no, I don't, uh, I don't want to write any uh, non-fiction, straight documentary, and remember the same as I never, never write notes when I remember things, I always feel it, it kills the imagination, it's best to let the thing go on, you know, but I know somebody who could do it, and um, I took him to lunch with the two editors of the series, and um, he wrote, I thought, uh, a very good book. He went to live in Bethnal Green, somewhere around Quaker Street, near the brewery. And um, I liked the book very much. But yes, it was a good series. I yes. Oh, you know the series. Yes, yes. Dennis yes. Potter did um, the new part, uh, not the new part. The Forest of Dean. Forest of Dean. Yes. How oh, recently did he do? Well, 61. I, 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 I'd have to go upstairs and see if I've still got a copy of it. Mm. And uh, I don't think I've got it among that. Look, I keep a lot of my London books down here. It's had a terrific London. Well, I still have a fairly good library in London. Here it is. But uh, now, my wife and boy are both interested in London, so I am um, 10 10 61. It's, he's inscribed it. So that came out. Um, and uh, finally, uh, he and his wife emigrated to New Zealand, and we exchanged letters for a time, and his letters became more and more unreadable. And I, uh, it wasn't until the Time Telescope, I was just going to say a few years ago, but it was when we still lived in Brighton, uh, which makes it more than 11 years ago. Uh, no, I can't, uh, no. Um, I can't remember how many years ago, because we, we saw a place down there, which I go to when I've got something fairly hard and intense to write. And I was on my own there, I know, uh, when they called, he and his wife called me up to the group. And um, they were established in Western Australia, they were very happy, got more about writing. Uh, but uh, the reason why his letters got rarer and read fewer and fewer, and uh, were more hardly hard to read, his sight was failing. Mm. Um, and that's all I know about the writing of the generation, except that um, Willie Goldman uh, stuck it and published a number of books after the war. I read two of them before, I thought they were very good. No, I'm sorry. You didn't well, say No, because they end up just being about problems of being a writer. Mm. Didn't he write a volume? One called The Tent of Blue, which was about. Yeah, which was, was. was that about. Uh, was that a sort of. Uh, I, can't remember remember which, book? No. I can't remember. But uh, I think he I think, I think he was all tied up. I think he was also connected with or started a little press of his own, didn't he? To who? One of these. Cresset Press published. Oh, it, Cresset were quite a creditable. Um, mm. with Margarita, La Margarita Lassie's husband that ran it, yes. Oh. Uh, no, I didn't. I thought it was uh, one of the small press. After the war, there was a proliferation of small presses, and 
Well, you never published anything after about 1948, and I wonder what happened to him as well. No, I, I knew he had managed to write to get about three books published mm -hmm. after the war, but um, I have no idea what happened to Willie Goldman. Uh, as I say, he was only a name for me. Blumenfeld is still alive. Simon Blumenfeld, I only hear of throughout, but I haven't for years, but heard of for other people, was told that he was well established as a journalist, sporting journalist, I think, but a journalist of some sort, yeah. a very prolific journalist, yes. And then there was, after the war, um, Lipinoff Cops, Emmanuel Lipinoff. Yes. yes. Um, well, he, um, I, I know both the Lipinoff brothers well, Emmanuel and Barnett, and uh, Manny's had a great success with this trilogy of his mm. Russian Revolution. Mm. Um, and uh, I think Penguin did it, didn't they? I don't one know. of the papers. Yes, I don't know. I have never asked. I haven't seen him to ask him whether you know. I don't know whether it's the kind of success, success that one can live on. Yeah. And indeed, I don't know what he has been living on because he used to be married to um, Cherry. Anyway, she ran a very successful model agency in the West End, and they lived in some state outside London. Uh, I, I think mainly on what she earned, yeah. but they split up. And I don't know where he is now or uh, what he does, except that um, he continued writing and did these uh, three books. Did any of the, the books, it's, I mean, I think it's rather sad, but as far as I know, but very few of your books actually got to the paper, did they? They were library readers, weren't they? Did, no. Did the army, did the Swan City for the Power? Oh, yes. Um, no, uh, from the city of the power sold not less than half a million. Really? In fact, yes. Um, which um, was very soon surpassed because um, the age of the big paperwork sale in this country was opened by Alan Silito uh, with uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning, it sold a million. And it moved very quickly, too. Um, and he's never looked back, you know. I mean, his novel was now going to sell that much, but. Um, I think he did well enough to establish himself. Um, I see him from time to time. I, uh, you know, he's a nice chap, and I think a, uh, a good writer. I don't mean that I, I, I don't, warm, I don't in fact warm to his novels, but he's got a great respect for the words he puts on the page. I think. But, um, so, that, oh, I, don't, I didn't because all the, all the books I have the no, no, um, artifacts and trying to pull yes, no, they're nearly all. It's just the last um, two or three. Um, I think about three books back, I lost my paper, but no, I think Granada, you see, I, uh, Pan used to do me, and then Granada, and I think that right up to my last published novel, all of my books except one, my last published novel hasn't come out in paperback, um, but uh, from what I'm free back on is American publishing, a few books back, uh, with uh, I lost my American publisher, so they were absolutely ruthless now about sales, you know, and, and um, whether I'll get one back when I eventually finish these two novels, I don't know. But, um, and, no, until then, uh, there was a time when I, I was able to live very well, not very well, but, you know, what I, to me, I was earning a better way than any member of my family had ever earned uh, from my novels, and um, I was getting a regular American sale. Uh, quite respectable sales in this country, paperback sales, paperbacks in America, and uh, not lots of translations, but uh, quite a few foreign translations. So, um, until a few years ago, I, I could, uh, you know, my, my books were still my basic source of income. And we, we hope. Farewell. Um, I just want. I mean, I like the very much as a novel. It seems to be the most autobiographical. Yes, it is. I, I knew people would take it as an autobiographical but novel. I was, my slight yeah. worry was was it not um, actually unrealistic to have a young Jewish person become a fighter pilot? Um, well, I, I can only say this that. Um, uh, 
Because that's the kind of middle of the three sections. Of yes, the yes. Well, Dennis Norton, uh, you know, Norton, Norton was a pilot uh, in the RAF. And I remember Rebecca West, during the fascist riots just after the war the meetings, went down to Ridley Road and she referred to a couple of young uh, Jewish uh, pilot, you know, uh, flying officers with the DFCs and the pilot's wings up, standing like young princes, as she put it, back in the crowd, sort of just watching silently. Um, and uh, I, two personal friends of mine, Jewish boys, were killed in the RAF. Uh, I was, air, you know, no idea in the early days of the aeroplane how air mad, air minded was the phrase, hundreds of thousands of boys were, um, until I became interested in politics. I spent all of my time uh, at aerodromes, they were quite close into London, staggering there to air crew and so on, uh, studying planes and, and um, even saved up as a trial lesson. And then, in fact, on the first morning of the war, I went to try and join the art. Our air, air crews, but um, nothing less than perfect sight was okay then, you know. And um, I was turned down and uh, just waited. I'd already registered, waited, waited until I was called up, you know, for the army. Uh, no, I didn't think that was unreasonable. Um, but I went, you see, I don't know why. Uh, after writing the old, I felt I had to write a Jewish novel, um, had to get something else off my chest. Um, I don't want to go into it too much here, but uh, I've always had a great personal rebellion against uh, the idea of a separate Jewish entity. Um, I mean, my father and both my grandfathers were free thinkers, and uh, so am I. Uh, and I'm an atheist, you know, and um, uh, I never wanted to live within this uh, defensive world called the Jewish community, you see, uh, and I had no real impulse to write a Jewish novel. Uh, I'm surprised that you liked it because the story of that novel is a strange one. Um, I wrote it. I, li I liked certain episodes, mainly the flying ones. Um, the description of the boy's first flight when he's small is: I flew in an old pre-1914 airplane when I was 10 years old, and still remains, I suppose, the most uh, exciting experience, wonderful experience, my memorable experience of my whole life, and. Um, I wrote this novel, was totally dissatisfied with it, and then I had some very bad eye trouble, um, which uh, the specialist I was sent to said might be the consequence of one of these flats over the head that I had had. Uh, it cleared up completely, but um, I was forbidden to do any work for six months. And Jonathan Cape had read this draft, you see, and I said, uh, don't publish it, I want to completely rewrite it. And I had I even had another folder with another 30,000 words written, and I wanted to re rework the whole thing somehow. And I'd chosen the whole background. The family was different. Uh, the, the, you know, this, the Dutch background was not my, my family's background. Uh, the characters were not, I no character, nobody in my, my family were all plain, hardworking people. We didn't have an Uncle Moss, if you remember mm. that character, yes, you know, yes, right. the oh. great spirit, you know. Um, although he's probably the most successful character in the book as far as impact is concerned, I don't know. Um, and I deliberately made this book up about observed people, and, you know, pushed it right outside my own life, but everybody has taken it as my one off that I've spoken to, or that's spoken to me about it, has taken it as my one off biographical novel. It truly isn't. And is, is it, would never, it would never have been published, certainly not in that form, but uh, when uh, Jonathan Cape heard that I had been told not to write, and to read it for the possible for six months. He was awful, he was, um, he, he was very nice to this guy, a mixture of uncle and headmaster. Um, uh, the only trouble was, as his son David said to me, we were frightfully mean. Uh, he told us very cheerfully at one of these great publishers' lunches that they buy you, you know. Um, he uh, got in touch with my American publisher, and they said, we'll publish this. 
uh, as it stands, and they put up an advance really to keep me for this period, and that's how it got published. Is is the uh, the protagonist of the low life also then simply an observed Jewish character rather than anything that derives from? You? Yes. Uh, Yes, I wonder where Harry Boy Bowers came from because uh, I, it's very hard to remember the seeds in the book. Strange things stir. It's in actually set in Ford and Rome. Oh, yes, completely. I mean, you've, you've got that right. Um, and Ford and Rome in its heyday, uh, when the black people who came were so gorgeous and respectable, and the sight of them all going up to the Baptist chapel on Sunday mornings. The wives were the wives were wearing these big ascot hats, you know, and uh, the dads were absolutely polished from head to foot, and boys wore Eton suits. A uh, marvellous sight, and they really put the, the old native population, what was left of it, it really got the old population really got scattered, those who weren't old and just died by the war, you see. Um, but uh, physically it's folded road completely, you see. Um, and uh, I will have a great love for Fulton Road. I've sometimes said to my wife that if I if I become a really successful writer, I think I would have bought that house in Fulton Road, my mum and dad's house, and either made it my working place to go to every morning to work instead of working at home, or or arrange for some nurses to live in it or something. You know, uh, I you know I, I whether it's that is Amelia as much as the character, I don't know, but. But uh, I've also known some of these uh, strange... First of all, there's this something that also hasn't occurred in my family. Um, I don't say that out of the respectability. And this, this same gambling streak among the Jews. Um, you know, which I, uh, uh, and secondly, uh, I have come across in my time uh, in the army, among other places, um, some of these chaps, and um, even chaps with, you know, with uh, uh, sort of, um, and one or two of the old school of Jewish gangsters as well. And I, I, I love the kind of streak of generosity in them, of uh, humour, and um, very often a strange kind of untrained, like wild flowers in the head, untrained feeling for culture, you know, uh, like Harry Boy's love of books. Mm. And uh, I, I know it just something grew on me until one day, I hadn't written for some months, which often happened with me, and um, if I didn't make notes of anything, I just put a sheet of paper in the typewriter and began uh, writing the first chapter, and after that I was plotting the book ahead and working it all out and so on, you know. Um, and that was the low life. So I like it very much. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Incidentally, I mean, one thing, I don't know if you've noticed it uh, in East End life, uh, is, um, you see, he has a kind of humour, uh, I mean, a humorous, uh, ironic and humorous uh, expression, uh, which is as much native East End as it is Jewish. In fact, uh, I, to me, those uh, national fronts are not, has been a, a, it may have all broken down now because I'm only occasional visitor to East London, but there was a kind of symbiosis between, certainly between the young Jews and uh, the young, uh, what, Anglo Saxons, whatever you call them, so that you sometimes couldn't tell one from the other. Uh, they spoke in the same idiom. Um, East End boys uh, from Christian families that I met in the army used more Yiddish words than, than I knew. And uh, if they were dark haired at all, uh, you couldn't tell one from the other, you know. Um, you could almost say now that it's like I'm on some young black. Yes, yes, just yes. yes. Um, yes. Their news pin for everything is yes. in common. Well, yes, the, the, uh, it's a generational. We use a terrible word of that culture. They come together, uh, their cultures mingle, and they make uh, mm. it's a, a, a culture out of it, so to speak. No, actually, the thing I like, I mean, I, I thought the best moment of the um, Hope Farewell was actually 
because it was unexpected the idea that it would be moss and kind of regenerate. And bring it back to life, yeah. yes, yes. Whereas the people who spoke to him were much more fun. And it was a garish, that's a very garish uh, extrovert, black marks here, you know, actually his Yes, well... ...to wish to live, you know, after that. Yes, I, I think that was, uh, I don't think it was actually, I think it was sort of cerebral, if you know what I mean. It yeah. seemed to me that people like Moss, I sometimes envy them, you know, uh, maybe thick skin and all that, but they, uh, they seem to radiate uh, the will to live, like, like uh, perhaps the will to survive, I don't know. But anyway, um, I remember seeing you uh, you referred to. So, I mean, when was, what was the last novel that was published? The last novel that was published was called Gentle Folk. Uh, I forget the date of it, um, probably about three years ago. And uh, the BBC, I, I wrote the film, we sort of did a film of it, um, the film twice. And uh, I liked it very much. I mean, the few people who read it, uh, it got favorable reviews. Um, but, uh, no, it's not my last novel, I'm sorry. After that I wrote one volume of what was going to be a two-volume epic about Spain. But the first volume set in the last year of the Civil War, and the second volume set um, during the weeks when Franco was dying. And I wrote the second volume first. I, um, I, I always do things in a crazy way. And I was foolish enough to show it to my publisher who grabbed it and said, this is a great suspense novel. It wasn't meant to be a suspense novel. Um, but I, to me, Spain, you know, I, uh, it was enacted really in miniature, it seemed to me the, uh, uh, everything that was happening on the earth in our time. And uh, so I still got the first one upstairs, half finished, done an enormous amount of research uh, for it, and uh, at some time I've got to uh, get that off. How, how involved were you with Spain? I mean, I've read uh, the in-between time, which uh, has Spain yes. had its back and forth. Well, uh, um, I, like Ted Willis and several of our friends in the Labour League, were very much involved with, with Spain. Um, in the first place, virtually every boy of our crown uh, volunteered, uh, but the people in charge of recruiting, uh, the communists, um, uh, sent us all home, partly because uh, we were nearly all, I was underage, you see, uh, at the time I volunteered. Um, 1938, I was in this 20, but um, they were determined not to be caught under the Foreign Enlistment Act after some MPs had created about a boy of 18 who was out there and they wouldn't send him home. And I think it was Alan Wilkinson, it was a Labour MP who took up his case and he was brought home in the end. And so, firstly, they wouldn't take anyone under 21, and secondly, they said that Ted and myself and one or two others who uh, were now running the National Committee of the Local League of Youth were far more important to the popular front than all the rest of it, where we were. But, um, uh, firstly, we were very much on the political inside by then, you know. Uh, <coughs> we were potagers of uh, Nye Bevan and Stafford Cripps and that crowd, you know and uh, met all the communist leaders frequently, you know, when, you know, popular funds, boom, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Ted ran the Youth Food Ship Spain Committee and was touring from Spain all the time. Um, I never got it far in Paris. I, I used to get sent to Paris regularly to see the offices of all these various people and met heaps of international brigade people, you know, uh, either uh, on leave or on the verge of going out or coming back and um, I remember after the triumphal return of the battalion with somebody that was like armistice in like 1918 and you know, they marched down Queen Victoria Street and the pavements all the way were packed and right. so on the others. But there were only about 300 of them. But afterwards, uh, smaller groups came back in ambulance train. One night, about 11 o'clock, I remember, about three of us went to meet uh, a load of wounded. I remember who were uh, hospital people, they had a wheelchair and ambulance and so on. And 
sinking, my arm is sinking a little bit, uh, all these lads were running around. I mean, outwardly in, in reasonable shape, you know, I mean, they were even inside their clothes. And, uh, but, yeah, but anyway, we, but I, I suspect that uh, I, I, this novel about Spain became a must. I think that um, even though we had excuses for not going, or we weren't able to go, I think it burned pretty deep into all of us that we hadn't been there. You know? mm -hmm. And because, uh, lots of ordinary lads from the branches just trickled off, went, you know, along the kill. And uh, that's why I think um, World War II came almost as a relief. You know, if you know what I mean, uh, well, now we're in it, you know. I mean, was, was it was happening in the 30s when you were there? I mean, a strong political culture on the left? Because, I mean, I'm not sure how much it's been mythologized, you know. Well, every working class person was no. running to Spain, everybody was in the wire scale on that. Yes, well, I, there was, there was a, uh, things ever, always get um, mythologized or fictionalized, given a fictional shape somehow, um, as time passes by. Um, and even if you speak to people who remember it, I found this going around all the international brigade, it's, it's a, very often becomes sort of sentimentalized in their memory and, you know. Um, no, if, uh, if I look back on Hackney in the 1930s after the war. Uh, most of the population of Hackney were respectable. You see, um, it's modern journalists who include Hackney in the East End, or perhaps it is the East End now, but in our days... No, it wasn't the East End, was it? No. It was a very respectable uh, well, class, but it was becoming slightly uh, degraded. Uh, well, middle class and, and respectable working class, yes, you see, uh, which was a, a real... A, a definite stratum, you know. I have plenty of respect for the working class in the East End, but the East End was special fields in the borough of Stepney and Bethel Green, you see. And uh, if you could just move up to Dalston, my goodness, you know, I, mean, my, I bet my parents were, you know, my dad thought, oh, I'm, I'm taking her out of it, you know, when he just moved a couple of blocks past Dalston Junction, you see. Um, well, there weren't thousands of young people in. Uh, in the lady with the white cells and patches. There were strong branches, probably much stronger than they are now. I mean, you know, you know the Labour Lady Group branches a couple of hundred members each, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, equally large bands, and some of those much larger bands of uh, quite decent and cheerful boys and girls joined the patchists. And we had a curious relationship with them because uh, on duty it was all boots and knuckle dusters. And off you, so we used to fraternize, it was like British and German troops in 1914, we all knew each other by name. Um, in fact, I mean, one of our fellows started going out with a fascist girl, you see. Um, and, uh, you know, we had long political discussions with them and asked them one, wonderingly, you know, how they could believe in it, and they would ask us sort of wondering, well, how can they believe in all this bloody bullshit stuff, you see. But um, it never affected the majority of people. Um, in fact, as even after the war, there's, I struck this note. I mean, uh, against all my previous political inclinations, I, I, I kind of felt after the war that, that if you're a writer, you would have got kind of on the, the species and see what makes people do these things rather than take sides, whatever your personal view is as a sort of big citizen are. Um, but uh, I would say that uh, the working class was old-fashioned labor in Hackney, passive, non-political, highly respectable, uh, until the amazing thing, uh, it may have been humanitarian, but I remember how moved I was, the beginning of the Spanish Civil War, um, it was we and the Labour League of Youth who started this food ship idea, <coughs> a ship load of food, which later uh, became many ships and railway wagons. It was continually going on. And all the branches of the League of Youth hired um, 
lorries and went round the streets and everybody had the same tale to tell. There wasn't a doorstep, there wasn't the poorest room where uh, the woman d didn't say, wait a minute, ducky, and she'd go in and fill around the shelves and come out with a tin of corned beef or a tin of cocoa or something. Um, you know, because um, they read either the Herald or the News Chronicle or the Mirror, and these pictures were full of the rows of dead kids in Barcelona and all that kind of thing. And then we held a meeting in Finbury Town Hall, and it was so wonderful. I mean, there was a bunch of us, you know, who got the thing going, standing some on some around the platform, and branch after branch was turning up with, um, with uh, railway porters' uh, trolleys, you know, and wheeling these piles of boxes of grub. Up. It was growing around the platform, and these really came from every single door that anybody knocked at in any borough in north and east London. Uh, that is the one moment of mass politics I can think of. Mm. In the East End proper, the only real mass politics was, was fascist and, and, uh, and it was, became a real movement of people for a period mm. until um, it all melted away in these great rent strikes and things like that when uh, uh, Thank heavens, uh, and the worst and the left good enough to try to mobilize the Jews against their neighbors. So they didn't, but in the Red Strikes, uh, I never thought it could happen. They, they, they just all joined together. Mm. According to Phil Ferretton, the communist MP, uh, there were lots of flats where uh, people were burning their fascist cars on bonfires, you know. But he also says in his book that uh, he'd never seen a real working class demonstration in his life, that people poured out of their houses onto the streets. Till we saw a fascist meeting at the Salmon Ball where chapters with the loudspeakers with everybody out, he said, at least four or five thousand people came pouring out from a couple of streets and marched 